Well, if you really wanted to study uh, the Queen uh, with all sorts of articles and books and TV and radio programmes, there are so many at your disposal, then you could certainly go up that route. But if you wanted to know the real person, you need to look no further than the whole movies that we talked about a little bit earlier on. Why? Well, because that is where you see the real person, the most natural person, the most relaxed person, the most happiest person, the most contented person. There she is, with her family, and her family with her. And if truth be known, isn't that true of you, and isn't it true of me? The question is, why should that be so? Well, if you could just take your whole movies for a moment, and you could take it up to the heavens, before the foundations of the world, what would you see? Well, you would see one God. But amazingly, this one God would be seen as three distinct persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we zoomed in, we would see, amongst other things, that there was perfect unity perfect harmony and perfect love. Nothing was lacking and yet they were desiring to create and to share all that they are and all that they have. And so if we quickly transferred our whole movies to Genesis 1, 27, you'd see this. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. All and every one of God's blessings are always good. Adam and Eve were to be the first earthly family. The fruit and the increase that will fill the earth for all future generations. And that will be through families and only through families. We can safely say that God loves families. Not all men and women are called to be married. That needs to be said and understood. The Lord Jesus himself never married. But we all come from a family. It may be a small family. It may be a big family. It might be a poor family. Perhaps it's a wealthy family. You might have many brothers and sisters to annoy you, or perhaps you're the only child. It matters not. God loves to work in and through families of all shapes and of all sizes. When God set forth the commandments, he says, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall write them on the doorposts of the house, and on your gates, and that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied. What a responsibility, as well as a great privilege, we have in our families, our homes, they ought to be little schools. Our homes ought to be small universities, living and breathing the things of God. 
What a blessing it is to have a family. What a blessing it is to be part of a family. What a privilege to lead a family, to bring a family up in the fear of the Lord. Well, if you'd like to turn with me to Luke 2, 41 to 52, that Jonathan very kindly read earlier, and we just pray that the Lord may bless us as we just have a look through that. I have four shortish points, and uh, I'll not name them. Peter's taking notes, so I'm, I'm going to keep him in suspense. <laughs> the first one is the excitement of the family holiday. The excitement of the family holiday. Well, how many of us enjoy going on holiday? We all have our favourite places. It might be the Dales, it might be Cornwall, it may be some far off land. And when that time of the year arrives, we all get very excited and we, we wait with great anticipation. I can uh, remember Dan's grandfather, the late Reverend Gwilym Roberts, asking the question, where does the word holiday come from? And then he told us, holy day, a day set apart. Well, the Lord, in his love and his wisdom, knows that we need a holy day to draw us away from the world, to be with him. And so the holidays we all enjoy are times when we can have breaks from school and from work and from everyday chores and enjoy one another. Well, here in Luke 2, 41, we learn that the parents of Jesus went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And this was their holiday. This was their holy day. There was no taxis about. There was no minibuses about. It was highly unlikely that they would even have a donkey. Because at that particular time, it was so busy. Instead, they would have walked. And they would have to walk something like 80 miles uphill along rough roads and paths and the journey would take about five days and the feast would normally last about eight days a lot of eating a lot of food well exodus 12 verses 5 tells us about the feast of the passover they were to take a male lamb without blemish they were to take its blood and sprinkle the doorpost over the house. It's the Lord's Passover. It's not man's. When God sees the blood, what will he do? He will pass over your family and the plague will not touch you when he smites the Egyptian families. This day you shall be a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generation, you shall keep a feast by ordinance forever. To the Jews, this was a very, very special occasion. A holy day, not to be missed. Now, a holiday wouldn't be the same without the children. Well, most of us would say that. Can you imagine... Mum and Dad leaving you at home? No, of course not. And so we find the 12-year-old Jesus going with his parents up to Jerusalem to the great Jewish feast of the Passover. Now we need to remember that Jesus grew just as any other child would grow. He would have to learn to help his earthly father. He would have looked just like any other boy. He would have played and he would have got dirty. He was hungry 
and he needed feeding. He was tired and he went to sleep. The boy, Jesus, was truly God manifested in the flesh. But he had laid aside his glory and power to come to dwell among us as a baby, as a child, and as a man. I wonder, as he walked up to Jerusalem, I wonder where his thoughts were. Were they that he was soon to be come, the Lamb of God without blemish, that takes away the sins of the world? That it would be his precious blood that would uh, cleanse us all from our sin? That one day that he would actually return to Jerusalem to be crucified, to die that terrible death so that we might live forever with him. What I wonder were his thoughts. The second point is the family fear. Now, if you were to go on holiday and lose your suitcase, it wouldn't be good news. And if it was your wallet, with all your cash and credit card, it would be pretty serious. But when you lose your child, well, it doesn't bear thinking about. Joseph and Mary, they were returning home to Nazareth, and they travelled one whole day, and they couldn't find the boy Jesus anywhere. Now, at this particular point, there's a tendency for us all to be quite judgmental. How on earth could a loving, caring parent not miss a 12-year-old boy over a period of a whole day? Well, there is a simple answer that hopefully encourages us not to be so sharp to be judgmental about people and events. You see, this journey, it always took place in large families. They would set off in a huge, large family, big groups. And they were always added to by large town groups as well. One group would always emerge in with the others so that numbers increased to thousands. And they were all strung along the way, walking or camping. And we've had similar unfortunate glimpses of that as we see these poor people as they leave the war-strown country of Ukraine, all in one direction. Thousands upon thousands of them, not knowing where they're going. Well, Josphias, the Jewish historian, he was actually from Jerusalem. So when he writes, he writes with great experience. And he tells us that often more than two million people assembled in Jerusalem at that particular time. So you can now have some sympathy for Joseph and Mary upon losing the young boy Jesus. And when they couldn't find him, they headed straight back to Jerusalem, perhaps fearing the worst, that they may never find him. They searched and they searched for a period of three days. And when they eventually found him, he was in the temple. The temple. There he was, sitting in the midst of teachers, both hearing them and asking them questions. And these were not scribes. They were not merely copyists. No, they were teachers who would have had a, a school of their own and they would have taught for a fee. They would state their case and the children would have to solve the case. But note, Jesus was not teaching. The God of order does not expect children to teach. No, Jesus was a modest scholar. He wasn't a forward child. And yet, all that he heard 
All had heard it. They were astonished at his understanding. They were astonished at his answers. Here was the creator, the preserver and redeemer of all things in heaven and earth. The one who knows all our foolishness. The one who knows all our sin. The one who knows all our ways. The one who gives power to the faint and increases strength to the weak. They were in the presence of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and yet he appeared to them in the form of a modest scholar, 12 years of age and not a forward child. His parents were amazed and we can understand the teachers being astonished for they would never have seen a baby like Jesus. But Joseph and Mary had been with him since birth and yet they were amazed. See how God honours families. There's a role for each one to play in order for us to function as happy God honouring. And Jesus fulfills his role as a 12 year old. Colossians 3 is our guide for happy families. Just listen. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it's fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases God. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. The day-to-day -day function and happiness of family life depends on heeding God's word. Many might consider this to be outdated, unnecessary, especially in these modern times. But is not our world, when we look around it, more like this, where wives who never submit but desire to rule, and husbands loving themselves more than their wives, and children picking and choosing what to obey, and fathers bad-tempered knocking people down with their own opinions. Is this not the reason for so much unhappiness, so much turmoil, so much sadness, so many broken homes. And here's the proof that Jesus and Mary and Joseph were a real family. Just in case anybody thinks that they were, oh, well, this was a special family. It was in many ways. But they were a real family with real problems and concerns. Listen to what his mother says. Son, why have you treated us so? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. You can feel the anxiety and you can feel the frustration as they feared the worst. Even if this had never happened to us, we can really relate to Mary and Joseph their worries and their concerns. They'd spent three days looking for him. And the last place they looked should really have been the first place. After all, they brought him up in the fear of the Lord and they should have expected to see him in God's house about God's business. Well, our duty is to bring our children up in the fear of the Lord, expecting to find them Worshipping with God's children that the foundation laid when they're young will stay with them and they will be built up throughout the whole of their lives. When Jesus told them that he'd been in his father's house they didn't understand but a day would soon come when they would understand as they stood at the foot of the cross and they watched him 
being crucified. How strong are your family bonds? How strong are my family bonds? Just look at this. Jesus on that cross saw his mother and disciples standing by whom he loved and he said to his mother, Woman, here's your son. And to the disciples, here's your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Jesus, the king of love, loved and honoured his parents as a 12-year-old boy, as he did as a 33-year-old man dying on that cross. Our third point is the return of the family. They'd set out as a family. They'd experienced family turmoil. And now they were returning home to normal family life, if there is such a thing. Well, we all know that there isn't. There's no such thing as normal family life. Life's full of ups and downs, full of the mundane, full of the unexpected. Birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, hospital visits, middle of the night crisis, funerals, arrival of newborn babies. And the list goes on and on. And despite all that had happened, we find Jesus returning with his parents to Nazareth. Nazareth. Can you remember in John when Philip tells Nathaniel that they'd found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph? And Nathaniel replies, Can any good, good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, we might wonder, how did Jesus cope? One minute he's in the temple, he's astonishing and amazing people, and the next he's in the backwaters of boring old Nazareth. Back to the old life, the predictable life, the old routine. But you see, Jesus was content. His desire was simply to please his father. He must be about his father's business. He would do anything to please his father. Content to be where his father would have him to be. Perhaps in the temple. Perhaps in Nazareth. Doing daily chores. Jesus was content. Are we contented people? Are we happy with what we could call simple life? Are we thankful? Are we praising people? Are we happy and praising families? Well, as a result of Jesus' contentment, we find that it says that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. You know, we don't have to go far to far off lands to become a missionary, to do great works, for us to find favour with God. We might be called to do so, and if we are, that's good. But if not, we're to be faithful people right where we are. And we also then will grow in wisdom. Not necessarily the wisdom of the world, gaining academic achievements and such like, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And happy is the man who finds such wisdom. But notice the boy Jesus also grew in stature. Now that doesn't mean he became bigger and stronger physically. No, it means that God was working in him and through him so that he could fill his great task of salvation for his people. And when we see more and more of this Jesus in our lives and worship him, with more and more gusto and more and more desire, then we too will grow in stature. And these things were happening. What did his mother do? Well, she kept all these in her heart. We often keep our memories of our children and families 
in photograph albums, or like the Queen, on perhaps home movies. But things like that can be lost. They can be erased, never to be seen again. But when we hide it in our hearts, it can never, ever be lost. It never fades. We can bring it back to remembrance. The heart is a good and a safe place to hide things. And we're told to hide God's word in our heart. We're also reminded that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that is why we need God to grant us a new heart. A new heart full of faith, full of Christ. Can I ask, what's your heart like this morning? And if you're not happy with it, then go to Jesus and just ask him to take away that deceitful heart that he might have mercy upon you and to give you a new heart. He not only can do it, he will. You just need to cry out to him. And the fourth and final point is a growing family. A growing family. God loves families. But his true and perfect love only comes through Jesus. Our story of Jesus at the temple ends when we're told that he found favour with God and men. You and I need to find favour from Jesus because he is the only one that can reconcile you with God. No matter who your family members are, they must all make peace with God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. Even the royal family must be saved by Jesus, the sinner's friend. Can I ask you, are you enjoying family life? But are you trying to live family life without Christ as the head and the heart? Are you trying to bring your children up with just a little bit of Christ? Are you trying to protect and provide your family without Christ? Can I tell you, you will fail. For without Christ, nothing. If Christ hasn't saved you, then sadly, you're not part of God's family. But there is good news. And the good news is in the book of Acts. This short story. Paul and Silas, they found themselves in prison. The prison keeper thought that they'd escaped when a great earthquake shook the prison and the doors opened. Thinking they'd escaped, he was about to kill himself. But Paul stops him and the keeper says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. But there's more. And your household. And your household. And then we're told later that the jailer was filled with joy because he and his whole family had come to believe in God. This man was not in God's family. And this man's family was not in God's family. But when the man believed, he immediately entered the family of God. And when each and every member of this man's family also believed, they too entered into the family of God. You might be thinking, I know so many families who don't believe in Jesus and they seem to be okay, they seem to be happy, they seem to be content. Everything's going their way. It's not what you see, it's what God says. God's children are called to walk by faith and not by sight. 
Hebrews 11 is a chapter about faith. And he tells us, from this one man, Abraham, who was as good as dead, came, what? Descendants, as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. God is bringing his family together throughout time. From the first days of Adam and Eve until the Lord returns. And then he'll gather his family together for the very first time. All together. A complete family in Christ. A perfect family in Christ. An eternal family in Christ. And they will be of every tribe and nation and colour from all peoples. None shall be barred but those that bar themselves. Will you be there? Is your unbelief barring you? God is adding to his family one by one. But he often delights to work within our families as we witness and pray and live to God's glory. Well, what a God. What a saviour. Can you imagine a family as numerous as the stars in the sky, as countless as the sands on the seashore? Impossible, you say. Yes, it is. But then we believe in the God of the impossible. Amen.